Hello, my name is Junius Johnson of Junius Johnson Academics, where wonder meets rigor, and welcome to the introductory lecture for the world of Narnia. Um, what I want to do with this lecture is I want to introduce you to the study that we're going to be doing over this course for the next seven weeks. Get some of the things out of the way that will be common to what we're going to be doing for the course so that we can spend all of the time that we have together in the live Zoom sessions just reading the books and talking closely about the books. And the first place I want to start is I want to ask the question, <clears throat> why read Narnia at all, especially as adults? I have a 14-week class for kids to read Narnia, and maybe that's a little bit more obvious because after all, they are kids' books, and so that kind of makes sense. But why read Narnia as adults? <clears throat> and the answer to this question, I want to point out that the study of Narnia is not for children. It is instead for those who need to renew the youth of their hearts. Now, this includes children, because hearts age at a frightful rate, and it doesn't take long before one needs to refresh the springs of wonder. But it also includes adults, and I think you'll agree that it makes adults rather the main target audience, for it is in adults that we find hearts that are tired and worn out, or tattered and frayed, or shriveled and hardened. Narnia is medicine for such hearts because it puts us back in touch with our youth. It carries us back to a time when our hearts were young and fresh and allows us to draw strength and wisdom from that earlier time. A childlike heart is the birthright of children, but they lack the wisdom and perspective of adults. But this wisdom and perspective has often come with a lamentable senility of the heart. If we could somehow combine these two, so that we leave, we have the youthful heart of the child and the wise soul of the adult, that would be a person well on the way to being truly human. Narnia can help us along that path. So come along with me and let's tread again the paths of childhood and discover the wild joy of the fact that one can enter another world through a wardrobe and that nothing is more likely than that there are other worlds everywhere, just around the corner, that it's in fact all in Plato. This journey is not safe, not at all, but like the one who is Lord over this land of wonders, it is good. That being the case, the question that naturally arises here at the beginning of this study is what order should we read the Narnia books in? Um, and for this class we're going to read them in publication order, um, but we need to deal with the fact that almost any set you can buy these days, unless you can find a used set, they're going to be printed in a different order than the order that they were originally published in. They'll be printed in a chronological order of when that book happens internal to Narnia's timeline. And there's a belief that this was what Lewis intended. Um, and this belief is based on two pieces of evidence. The first piece of evidence is a letter um, that was uh, written to a child, an uh, 11 year old boy, on April 23rd, 1957. <clears throat> this boy was having an argument with his mom. He'd already read Narnia once, and he realized that the books were out of order, and he wanted to, for his second reading, go back and read them in the order internal to the world. It's a very understandable thing. I myself did this as a child. I reread them in that order. In fact, I actually read them once where in the silver chair, when Jill and Eustace come to the banquet at Care Paravel in the beginning, uh, a, a singer comes in and sings the tale of the horse and his boy and when I got to that point I stopped reading the silver chair went and read the horse and his boy and then came back into the silver chair from that reading I don't really recommend that it wasn't my best reading <clears throat> so this child actually wrote to Lewis to try to settle the dispute he was having with his mom and Lewis replied this he says I think I agree with your order for reading the books more than with your mother's the series was not planned beforehand as she thinks when I wrote The Lion, I did not know I was going to write any more. Then I wrote P. Caspian as a sequel and still didn't think there would be any more. And when I had done The Voyage, I felt quite sure it would be the last. But I found that I was wrong. So perhaps it does not matter very much in what order anyone read them. Note what he does not say. He doesn't say, therefore, this is absolutely the right way to do it. There's a little quirk of Lewis that I think it's important to keep in mind here, which is, Anytime a child is disagreeing with an adult, Lewis is going to be predisposed to agree with the child. So that's worth noting. But what he, his, really, his whole point here is just that 
he didn't plan them to go in this order, so maybe it doesn't make that big a difference whether you read them in this order or in another order. I will say that also this is a letter to a child, and while that's an important thing, it's not necessarily strong enough to be the basis of a hard dogma. Well, there's another piece of evidence, and this one's a little bit more uh, robust, and that is Lewis's own uh, godson, his, his stepson, Douglas Gresham, Joy Davidman's son, he remembers a conversation in which uh, Lewis, with, that he had with Lewis, in which Lewis seemed to prefer the chronological order. And he says this about it. He says, Harper Collins asked me, what order do you think we ought to do them in? And I said, well, I actually asked Jack himself what order he preferred and thought they should be read in. And he said he thought they should be read in the order of Narnian chronology. So I said, why didn't you go with what Jack himself wanted? So it's my fault, basically, the order of Narnian chronology, and I'm not the least bit ashamed of it. Uh, that seems to be a pretty solid thing. If, if Doug had this conversation with Jack and that was what Lewis said, that's a strong indication that that's what Lewis wanted to be done. Interestingly, uh, Lewis scholars, myself included, are not entirely sure that Mr. Gresham got the conversation right. Um, it's a type of detail that, um, that it, it's quite easy for Doug to misunderstand something that Lewis would say because they were very different in terms of how they relate to details. But um, the, the big point here is that all of both of these pieces of evidence, whatever we say about them, what we're after is trying to figure out what was C.S. Lewis's intention. How did the author want these books to be read? Um, what I find interesting is that Lewis scholars, including myself, pretty much universally agree that publication order is the correct order and not the Narnian chronology. Well, that's strange. Why don't we just accept these two pieces of evidence as this is what Lewis thought and be done with it? What's really at stake in this? And I would argue that quite a bit is at stake because there are internal considerations to the books. And here's a couple of examples of what I mean. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, we come to this point where Mr. Beaver tells the children for the first time that Aslan is moving. And we read this. They say that Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Well, friends, if you've read The Magician's Nephew, you know very well who Aslan is. You know him as the creator of Narnia, as the lord of that world. You know him as someone who can give out quests for children to do things. Right? So when you come to this moment in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, it's completely emptied of its power. If you come to this book first, then... You feel the power because when Lewis goes on to describe the way that name affects each one of them, it, it, it ignites a fierce curiosity in your soul to know who this Aslan is and why he's so important and why he should affect us in this way. In fact, that gets to the second point I want to make, which is that a prequel isn't the same thing as a book that was written before another. Right? If I write The Fellowship of the Rings and then I write The Two Towers, besides being a plagiarist, there's a relationship that holds between those two things where when you come to the two towers, I expect you to know what's in the Fellowship of the Ring. But when you're reading the Fellowship of the Ring, I don't expect you to know what's in the two towers. Now, what if Tolkien had written them in another way? What if he had written the two towers first and then had written the Fellowship of the Ring as a prequel to the two towers? Well, he would have written the Fellowship quite differently in that case because he would expect you in reading Fellowship to know everything that had happened in two towers. And that changes the way you interact with what he has to say, and it changes the way he wants to present what he has to say. We can see this at work in The Magician's Nephew when he says things like, he's the Professor Kirk who comes into other stories, or this is the story of the beginning of all the comings and goings between that world and ours. That's not the right place to start. It has a very different impact on the reader. It actually has a very different literary mode than reading them in the publication order. And this other point, this last point I'll make about this is a little bit subtle, but I think it's an important one. It's acknowledged that there are consistency issues in the Narnian books, and these issues are there because Lewis often thought he was writing the last book. As we saw in that quote above, for at least the first three books, every time he wrote a book, he thought, this is it. This is the last one. Um, so he, he hasn't planned what's going to come later, and you see him saying things in the earlier books that are contradicted in later books when he goes to actually flesh out that particular piece of information. Now, I think that it is these these consistency issues 
are much less disruptive to your reading if you take them in publication order than if you take them in chronological order. It's easier to see the world developing and the author's understanding of the world growing if you take them in publication order versus putting them into chronological order. You're starting with a very fleshed out, mature understanding of Narnia and then going back to a very um, nascent and very youthful understanding of Narnia. And that's, a, but that's quite a disruptive experience I found as a reader. The literary experience is quite different. And I say this as someone who has read the books in every imaginable order. Um, so it's not that I've, you know, I've tried it and I've, I've read them multiple times in chronological order and they don't have the same hook. They don't grab me in the same way and they don't have the same weight to them as they do when I take them in publication order. So again, why take that, all those things over and above what Lewis thought? Well, friends, Lewis was a literary scholar. He was a literary critic by training. It is not possible that he was not aware of the types of literary considerations that I've just brought up. And it's also not possible that he not care about them. Um, I've, I've had conversation with several Lewis scholars about this, and, and the consensus seems to be that we don't think, we think Doug must have gotten Lewis wrong because we think that Lewis would care about just these types of questions and that he would be aware of them. And so in unguarded moments, he would be permissive and say, yeah, read them however you want to, that's fine. But if he really sat down to lay out what's going to be the best experience of the books from a literary perspective, my opinion and the opinion of the Lewis scholars I know is that he would have come down on the publication order. And for that reason, that's the order that we're going to read them in. Okay, now the last thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about Aslan's purposes for Narnia. Why did Aslan create Narnia? What's it for? And that's going to lead into a discussion of what our purposes are in reading Narnia in this course as well. And the first thing that I want to say about Narnia, well, the first purpose I think Aslan has for this land is he intends for Narnia to be a teacher. Look at what he says to the children in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Um, Lucy says, it isn't Narnia at all. You know, this is when they've been told that Edmund and Lucy have been told they can't come back. And Lucy bursts into tears. And she says, it's not Narnia at all. It's you. We shan't meet you there in our England. And how can we live never meeting you? But you shall meet me, dear one, said Aslan. Are, are you there too, sir, said Edmund. I am, said Aslan. But there I have another name. You must learn to know me by that name. This was the very reason you were brought to Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you may know me better there. You see what Aslan's saying? Narnia has a teaching role for the children from our world who comes there. They're meant to learn something in Narnia that would be harder to learn in our world and then go back into our world with that knowledge. Aslan's second purpose for Narnia, the first purpose is for it to be a teacher. His second purpose is for Narnia to be a refiner's fire. Um, Narnia had sets various trials for the children to overcome, and these trials aim at the correction, purification, and edification of the character of those called into Narnia. Edmund and Eustace don't just learn not to be beastly, they're also transformed into heroes and even legends. So look at what, um, <clears throat> in this conversation, this bit from the Silver Chair in the first chapter, um, Eustace and Jill are having a conversation and they're talking about they, who are the bullies at the school that they go to. And Jill says, I suppose you mean we ought to spend all our time sucking up to them and currying favor and dancing attendance on them like you do. To which Eustace replies, Paul, is that fair? Have I been doing anything of the sort this term? Didn't I stand up to Carter about the rabbit? And didn't I keep the secret about Spivens? Under torture, too. And didn't I... And he gets interrupted because Jill starts crying. But when they come back around to it, she says, I'm sorry, Scrub. I wasn't fair. You have done all that this term. Now, Eustace is quite insistent on this. He's, he even goes on to say, so you have noticed a change. And she says, it's not just me. They have noticed a change. I heard, overheard them saying that something would have to be done about you soon. And that sort of sends a shiver. Um, Eustace, when he talks about why this change has happened, he explicitly points to his time in Narnia. Because Jill comes back around to it and she says, why were you so different last term? And he says, a lot of queer things happened to me in the halls. And Lewis says, he says this mysteriously. Well, okay, what's the mystery? What sort of things? Says Jill. Supposing I told you I'd been in a place where animals can talk, 
and where there are hmm, enchantments and dragons and, well, all the sorts of things you have in fairy tales. That's the reason I'm different, because I've been in this place where these things in fairy tales are not just things in fairy tales, they're actually real. So it's the second purpose of Narnia, it's created to be this refiner's fire uh, for at least the children from our world who are brought into it. But there's a third purpose of Narnia, and I think that is equally important, and we must not forget this last portion. Narnia, Aslan creates Narnia for delight. He creates it for delight. It wasn't just created for the extrinsic end of training children in our world to know Aslan better and to be better people. It's not as if Narnia exists for our world. It exists for itself. It was created for itself, just like our world was. It was created for the sheer delight of it. It is meant to be explored and enjoyed. And this is, I think, why we see so little of it. Have you ever thought about this? How little of Narnia we see? We see the smallest part of its geography. At one point, we're told that Narnia is not even one-fourth the size of the smallest province in Calorman. And we never see but a tiny little bit of Calorman. We never see Telmar. We never see the Western Wastes. There's a whole Western Ocean. We have no idea what's over there. Even in sailing to the eastern end of the world, we see a tiny sliver of what's in that ocean. We see very little of the north, right? Also, there's all kinds of people who live in Narnia. We meet very few Calamines in our journey. There's a lot of folks that live their entire lives that we never meet in Narnia. We meet just one, there's a couple of people in the Lone Islands, no one else. Um, it has a 3,500 year history, and the sum total of what we see of that 3,500 year history, if we're generous, doesn't amount to more than about 20 years. This is because the truth of Narnia, the meaning of Narnia, if you will, isn't something about our world. It is for itself. And for all that the intrusions from our world are very significant, they are not the majority of experiences in that world, but the exception. Long ages run without any interference from our world. A great passage about this in the last battle. Um, Jill uh, is walking with Jewel the Unicorn, and she says, this is so great. It's so nice to just be walking in Narnia. I wish it were like this more often. She says, it's a pity there's always so much happening in Narnia, and so we don't get to just enjoy it peacefully. But the unicorn explained to her that she was quite mistaken. He said that the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve were brought out of their own strange world into Narnia only at times when Narnia was stirred and upset. But she mustn't think that it was always like that. In between their visits, there were hundreds and thousands of years when peaceful king followed peaceful king till you could hardly remember their names or count their numbers. And there was hardly anything to put into the history books. Now you might think, well, that sounds boring. Thank goodness the children from our world come in. But Jewel goes on and shows that it isn't so. He went on to talk of old queens and heroes whom she had never heard of. She spoke of Swan White, the queen, who had lived before the days of the White Witch and the Great Winter, who was so beautiful that when she looked into any forest pool, the reflection of her face shone out of the water like a star by night for a year and a day afterward. He spoke of Moonwood, the hare, who had such ears that he could sit by cauldron pool under the thunder of the great waterfall and hear what men spoke in whispers at Camp Harabell. He talked of whole centuries in which all Narnia was so happy that notable dances and feasts, or at most tournaments, were the only things that could be remembered, and every day and week had been better than the last. <clears throat> and that is very interesting. That description of every day being better than the last is very similar to the way Lewis will describe heaven as life after death in Aslan's country at the end of The Last Battle. It's a book in which each chapter is better than the one that came before it. So there's something heavenly about Narnia's existence. Narnia participates in the joys of heaven in between the times when the children from our world are coming into Narnia. And so Narnia exists for itself and for delight and not just to be a teacher and to be a refiner's fire. So if these three things are Aslan's purposes for Narnia, then our purposes are going to mirror Aslan's purposes in this course. Narnia is a teacher for Aslan and so it will be for us. We'll be looking at how Narnia holds up a mirror for us to see in our lives what we would normally not see. 
just as Aslan thought it would be easier for the children to get to know him in Narnia and then come back into England and know him better there. Likewise, we're going to come to Narnia to look for things that it's hard for us to see in our everyday lives in this world, but that Narnia can make clearer for us, and then we can return to our world and recognize those things in our world as well. Just as Narnia is a refiner's fire, we're going to ask, how does Narnia challenge us to change who we are, to leave behind beastliness and become something heroic and decent instead? And to that end, the encounter is where Aslan is judging the children, where the children come face to face with him and have to give an account of themselves before Narnia, are going to be very important for us. And we're going to put ourselves before Aslan, and we are ourselves going to be judged by Aslan as the children are being judged. And then, again, Narnia is for delight. And so in every moment, we will also be, whatever we're doing, whether we're talking about Narnia as teacher, Narnia as refining fire, we will also be reconnecting with the child in us who first read Narnia, or the child in us who is awakened by reading it, if this is your first time. This journey we're going on here in this course is above all a journey of joy. So welcome to the world of Narnia, and welcome to this joyful journey we will take. I'm very much looking forward to our sessions together, and I can't wait to get started. You can join us. Uh, this is when the course is going to happen. If you haven't registered for the course yet, this is when you can register for the course. You can go to academics.juniusjohnson.com slash courses slash World of Narnia and uh, sign up for the course. Registration closes March 25th, so sign up soon, and I hope to see you there.